So hello everyone and welcome for this sixth week of the course of networks. And today what we're going to be doing is to consider discrete time random walks uh, on, on graphs. So the whole course is going to be about random walks, but this first video is about discrete time random walks. So if you remember last week, we've been looking at the, the interrelations that exist between some linear processes and structures that are present in graphs. And we've been mainly focusing on uh, consensus dynamics. That was this model in which you would have that the nodes try to adapt their state to the state of their neighbors. But we've also shortly mentioned uh, discrete time random walks. What we're going to be doing today is to, yes, to consider a certain number of their properties. And as you see, the theory can be quite rich for those. So just as a reminder, what is the process that you're interested in? So, so here in this video, we will be looking at discrete time, uh, at a discrete time process in the sense that we'll have workers that all move together at what time? One, two, uh, well, t, t plus one, etc. And in the next videos, we will also generalize this in order to, to focus on continuous time random walks where now the events will happen at a certain rate. And so, yeah, uh, it's a personal process, as we see, and they happen continuously in the course of time. Okay, so what is the process? We have a graph, and we'll have basically that we'll have an ensemble of workers in the statistical sense. And each of these workers, when they make a move, well, they will have to choose an edge to take. And so it means that if I have a worker that is located here, at the next step, it will move and it will go with a priority one third to this node there, one third to this node here, and one third to that other node. Yeah. And we need to have the sum of these priorities, one third, one third, one third, is equal to one in order to ensure that the total probability of observing a worker somewhere is gonna be conserved. Yes, we need to have this conservation rule. Now, something, so here in the following will be denoting uh, the position of the workers by a certain vector P of T, whose entries are P one of T, P uh, N of T. Now, Something that's quite important to understand is that random walks on networks are mathematically completely equivalent to Markov chains. So instead of having nodes and links in a Markov chain, we would have instead states and probabilities to go from one state to another one. And so when you go from a graph perspective to a Markov chain perspective, what you need to do is to find what is the relation between the adjacency matrix and the transition matrix to go from I to the state I to the state J in one step in the Markov chain. And actually what you're gonna be having is that this is gonna be equal to one AIJ divided by KI. And this is indeed trivial to show that if I do a sum of all of the outgoing links of node I of this AIJ divided by KI, would obtain that this is equal to ki divided by ki, which is equal to one. So indeed, we have here uh, naturally implemented this conservation of probability. So now, wh what does the process look like? So what we'll have now is a process that takes this form. We have pj at time t plus one. It's gonna be equal to a sum of all of the neighbors of node j of pi at time t times this transition matrix ij. And it basically estimates the fact that if I'm on j, I will look at all of my neighbors and look at the priority that, that's gonna go from the previous step at node i to the current step at node j. Now, this equation can be written in a vector form. So we'll have that pt, the vector p, is gonna be equal to p0, the vector p0, and then we'll have uh, sorry, I'm one step ahead. It's going to be, excuse me for this. You're okay. We'll have PT plus one is going to be equal to PT times the transition matrix. And clearly, this is a recursive uh, equation that you can solve, at least formally. And we'll have the vector P at time T 
it's going to be equal to the initial vector, like the initial distribution of the workers on the nodes. And then we'll have t to the power t. Now, when you have a Markov chain, and the Markov chain is in, in general directed, right? Because you have, it's not because the graph is undirected, because if, for instance, from here to there, we'd have a transition of one. It's not because the underlying graph is directed, that the transition matrix would be directed. And in general, this transition matrix is a directed uh, object. But what's important is that when you have a Markov chain, and so here, let's say that this is my Markov chain where the directed edges correspond to these transition, uh, or to, 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 to these possible transitions that take place between the nodes. Well, when we have such a, such a Markov chain, well, typically in the Markov chain, you, you may have different types of states. So something that is important is that we need to have that the sum over the j's of tij is equal to one, which basically means that each node needs to have some outgoing edges. And we need to have that the sum of those is equal to one, the sum of the weights. Here I didn't write the weights just for the sake of simplicity. So what are these different types of nodes that exist for Markov chains and hence also for random walks on networks? The first ones would be absorbing states. Uh, an absorbing state is, is a state such that T I I is equal to one. Which means that it's a node that is such that all of the flow goes back from the node to that very same node. And equivalently, it means that t i j is going to be equal to zero when i is different from j. So it means here that there is no possibility for the probability to escape that node, hence the, the name absorbing state. And an example of such an absorbing state here would be this node, which is indeed absorbed. So another important concept is the concept of ergodic set. So an ergodic set is a set of nodes, a set of states, such that you can go from any state i to j, and from any j to i, yes, but also you do not escape the ergodic set. So once you're in the ergodic set, you're going to be staying there forever. So what would be an example of an ergodic set here? Well, for instance, this set of nodes, these three nodes, are clearly forming an ergodic set because once you're in, you're in one of the green nodes, you're going to be staying there forever. And clearly, you can go from any node to any node in uh, just in, in a certain number of steps. Now there is a final type of node that is important, and that would be uh, the concept of trans. Sorry, uh, um, of transient node. Node, and basically it's a state that is neither. Uh, it's a state. that is not a member of a ergodic set. So if you're not part of an ergodic set, it means that the property that on you is going to be either directly or directly leaking out until asymptotically you, you can be sure that the property to be on one of these transient, transient nodes is going to be equal to zero. And an example would be that one here. It's a node that indeed, if you start from there, just after one step, you leave it. And you will never visit that node anymore. So just a, a tiny node, an absorbing state is actually an agonic set. Yes, it's just an agonic set made of one single node. And so clearly in this example, we just had one transient node, that node that is such that after some time, we can be sure that it will not be visited anymore by any uh, any uh, any worker. Now, once you have this uh, this th this transition matrix, well, typically a very important concept is the co concept of stationary density. And this transition stationary density that we write by p star, which is equal to p one star, p n star. 
And it is such that the P star is equal to P star times T. So basically it means that this is an eigenvector of eigenvalue one of the transition matrix. So can you be sure that it exists? Intuitively, yes, right? We'd expect it to happen given the process. But can we be sure of that? Well, actually we can be sure that it exists because we know that T times the vector of ones is equal to the vector of ones. And this is something that is directly shown from this expression here, which basically means that we have a right eigenvector of eigenvalue one, and hence we need to have a left eigenvector that we denote by P star of eigenvalue one for the process. And actually many interesting properties of graphs are associated to the properties of this P star, as we'll see later. Now, okay, so um, I just need to find back the right pages. Now, what can what can we say about this this process when it takes place on a graph? So, so clearly we have a formal solution of, uh, of the process, and this formal solution is given by this matricial equation here. But it, it doesn't allow us to gain a lot of intuition about how the process actually yeah, takes place inside the graph. And as we'll see, a very, yeah, a very powerful way to gain some intuition is to change the basis in which we're going to be representing the system and to adopt a basis that basically is aligned with the eigenvectors of that transition matrix. So but just before we do so, something that needs to be clarified. So what, would, what can we say about these eigenvectors? Well, clearly we have this transition matrix that, as we said before, needs not be symmetric. So actually, we can think about it when you have a non-directed graph, AIJ is symmetric. The only possibility for the transition matrix to be symmetric is when the graph is regular and all of the nodes have the same degree. But in general, otherwise, we'll have that if we have an undirected graph, its transition matrix will be as an asymmetric matrix. But yet, the thing is that the spectral properties of this T matrix are actually can be directly derived from the from the from another matrix, which is this one here, which is Aij divided by the square root of Ki times Kj, and that one clearly is a symmetric one. So because that matrix there is symmetric, we can basically perform a, a spectral decomposition of it in terms of its eigenvectors and the left and right ones will be the same. We we'll basically have that this A tilde IJ, it's gonna be equal to a sum for, uh, for L, sorry, going from one to N, sum of all of our eigenvectors of the lambda L times U, L, U, L transpose, where the U, L is the eigenvector associated with the eigenvalue lambda L. Now, and where, because of the fact that we have a symmetric matrix, we also have that we choose the U, Ls in such a way that they will actually be orthogonal and normalized. Yeah. Now, something that is interesting to note is that this matrix Tij is simply equal to the square root of Ki, of, uh, of Kj, sorry. And then we have Aij tilde, and then we have that it's divided by the square root of Ki. Yeah. Which in matrix notations can be written as the fact that this is D minus one half, where D is this diagonal matrix with the degrees that would be put on the diagonal. And then we have times this A tilde times the D one half. And because of that, it's really straightforward to show that the matrix T and the matrix A tilde have the same eigenvalues. And these eigenvalues are real because we know that A, A tilde was symmetric, so it has real eigenvalues. So it means that the transition matrix also has real eigenvalues. And we'll have that the vectors will be, if we take the left eigenvectors, it's going to be equal to, then we'll have 
u l one square root of k one u l uh, n square root of k n. So we, we can directly obtain these eigenvectors just by multiplying each entry by the square root of the degree. While for the right eigenvectors, we basically something similar, we'll be dividing by the square root of the degree. Then we have here a u l, the nth entry of it, and we divide by the square root of k and the nth degree. And so it basically means here that we directly can get something about the eigenvectors, uh, uh, the eigenvalue and, and, and the eigenvectors, because we, we, we can construct them from orthonormal ones, yes? And we know that the eigenvalues are going to be real numbers. So actually this, can, this is going to be implying something interesting. So if I take t to the power t, which is exactly this quantity that is of interest for the solution of the random work process, well, basically what I will get is that this is going to be equal to d minus one half a tilde d one half to the power t, which is equal to d minus one half a tilde d one half, which again we can rewrite as d minus one half. Then we have the sum over from L going from one to N of lambda L to the power T U L U L transpose uh, D uh, one half, which we can rewrite in terms of the left and right uh, eigenvectors. So this is a sum of all of the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of lambda L to the power T. And then we have U L right, U L uh, left. Yeah. Now, and therefore mm -hmm. what it implies is that if I'm now looking for the solution P of T, it's gonna be equal to my P zero, T to the power T, which is gonna be equal to a sum for uh, L going from one to N of lambda L to the power T, then we'll have U L left, and then we have the scale product between P zero and the right eigenvector. Yeah. So how can I interpret this? So actually this here, is just a L zero. This is the amplitude along the Lth direction of my basis of my initial condition. Yes, this is just my initial amplitude in that direction, in this mode. And what it tells me here is that actually this amplitude is gonna be evolving in time. And what I'm gonna be having is that my solution will be such that the P, uh, I, the, in the, in the, the the product to be on node i at time t is going to be equal to a sum for l going from 1 to n of a certain amplitude in this l direction of my basis. And then I will have my vector a l, uh, sorry, a, the, my left hand eigenvector l, sorry for that. Uh, yeah, that shouldn't be A here, that should be a U. Uh, and that would be with index I. And it basically means here that the property to be, a node on a, uh, to be on a certain node at a certain time can be obtained from what's happening in all of these eigen directions. And how does the amplitude evolve along these eigen directions? We will simply have that A L T is equal to lambda L to the power T, A L zero. So, and here, when you think about it, we, we get now a solution where instead of having to deal with product of matrices, as we had here, we now simply have to deal with N equations that, that are independent and that tell us how the amplitude along all of these directions are evolving in time, yes? Now, 
actually this this transformation where we, we we've been changing the signal for from our initial uh, from from being de defined on nodes to amplitudes associated to the eigenvectors of the Laplacian is something that is usually called the graph Fourier transform. And this graph Fourier transform, basically what it does is to transform the vector of t's into a vector of amplitudes. It would be a vector associated to, to certain spatial frequencies. And these, and that would be this one. Yes, A, and T. And this graph Fourier transform is called like that in analogy with the usual tra Fourier transform where in the Fourier transform you have a signal and then basically you decompose the signal in a basis that is formed by exponential of i k x from which you get amplitude that are associated to different values of k. And this naturally appears for instance in the heat equation and why? Because this basis here it can be seen to be some sort of an eigen function of the Laplacian in the heat equation. Well, here we have something that is very, very much the same. We have a basis that is well adapted to our problem, and that would be the, uh, the basis that comes from the eigenvectors of the transition matrix. And basically, we are changing the way we represent, we represent the system in order to simplify its representation and to simply have now n independent equations about the way these amplitudes are evolving in time. Now, something that is also important to understand is, is what, what can we say about the time evolution of these amplitudes and hence about the, the sum of the contributions of all of those modes. Well, for this, the first thing that is important to note is that so it can be shown that these eigenvalues, they, they will always be inside minus one, one. So the, the lambda equal to one is associated to the stationary state. And exactly in the same way that we had some, some properties of eigenvalues for the Laplacian, it can be shown that lambda one equal to one is unique. If, if, and we, and actually we're going to be calling that one uh, lambda one, yes. So that so when we ranking the eigenvalues from the largest, that would be lambda one, and then going to be having lambda two. They're all between. Well, let me see if I can do it a bit a bit better. They will all be between minus one. And one, so we have like a sequence of eigenvalues that will all be here between minus one and one. And this lambda one is unique if the graph is connected. And actually, it can also be shown that lambda n is equal to minus one if and only if the graph is bipartite. Okay. Now, what about the time evolution that would be associated to our solution, our general solution here at the top? Well, let's first look at what's happening when we let the t go to infinity. Then we'll basically have that all of these terms with lambda different from one are gonna be, well, we do that, t going to infinity, and we will be assuming from the time being that the graph is not bipartite. And why do we do so? We do so because otherwise we may have some small technical difficulties that are not so terrible, but it's gonna di distract us from the important message. This is a, a bipartite graph. When you have a bipartite graph, you have the possibility for oscillations to take place. Because if I start with all of my probability here, at the next step, it will be here, and then go up, down, up, down, up, down, and we're going to be having oscillations. And we will never have a convergence towards the stationarity. So it means here that from now on, we assume that the graph is not bipartite. But in that case, when t goes to infinity, we basically have that we're going to be converging because all of these 
lambdas to the power t are going to be going to zero, except when lambda is equal to one. So what we're going to be having is actually that we're going to be converging to a certain p star, which is equal to u l max, which would be uh, the eigenvector associated to the largest eigenvalue, times we have p zero u r max. And because of the fact that the u r max is equal to the vector of ones, as we said before, and because p zero is a probability, we basically have that this quantity here is equal to one, which basically tell us that the, uh, the asymptotic state is simply given by the left eigenvector of the transition matrix, as is expected. Now, if we still consider large values of t, but look for the next contribution, then what we'll have is the following. So we have the p of t, it's going to be behaving like, so we have this u l max, and then we'll have this p0 u r max, plus lambda 2 to the power t times we'll have, the p, oh, sorry, then we'll have the u 2 uh, to the, so u 2 the left, and then we'll have p0 u2 right. And so it means here that what's going to happen is that we're going to be having that the next contribution is going to be associated to what's happening for the eigenvector that has the largest eigenvalue except for lambda 1. Now here, just a small detail, in principle it should be the one that has the largest absolute value. We will be assuming that this is this one here and there is, and that there is actually no Eigen, eigenvalue that is too close here from the minus one. Again, just for simplicity. Well, if we have that, what's happening? Well, it basically means here that we have this dominant behavior and actually all of the other ones, all of the contributions of the form lambda L to the power T are gonna be much, much smaller than the lambda two to the power T when T is sufficiently large. And so that, that's why most of the terms that are appearing here are vanishingly small, and only these two are going to be dominant, which reminds us uh, to what we've been doing about time scale separation, for instance. And, and so it basically means that, uh, well, what can we say then about the convergence to the stationarity? Well, the convergence to stationarity is going to be determined, but it's going to be given by an exponential decay, yes, that is going to be controlled by this lambda two. And Actually, what, what, what's going to happen is that a very important factor would be this one minus lambda two, which is usually called the spectral gap. And we're going to be having that if the one minus lambda two is small, we will basically, uh, well, the values of this spectral gap are going to be affecting the way uh, the relaxation takes place. When the one minus lambda two is very small, meaning that we are very close to here, then we'll have a very slow relaxation. When the one minus lambda two is large, there's a big separation. What's going to happen is that we're going to be a very fast uh, convergence. Yeah. Now, actually, this this spectral gap that we naturally see coming here from uh, from, yeah, from from the spectral properties of the transition matrix can be related to a very important uh, concept of graph theory. And this concept is the so-called Cheeger inequality and the Cheeger constant, also called uh, the conductance. So, so what is this conductance H? Well, H is the following. So given a graph, we'll have that if you can find this quantity here, let me first write it. So it's the number of edges that connect S and S bar divided by the minimum of the volume of S with the volume of S bar. So what we do is the following. So we, we have a graph.
We partition it into two sets of nodes, S and the complement of S. And what we try to do is to find the best bipartition such that we can, we're going to be minimizing the number of edges that go from one to the other. And this looks very much like the cut that, that we've seen before. But we don't, just don't try to minimize the cut because we know that when we minimize the cut, we can get trivial solutions. We minimize the ratio of the cut with the minimum of the volume of S and the volume of S uh, complement. And what is the volume of S? It would be a measure of the size of S. The volume of S is equal to the sum for all of the nodes that are in S of Ki. So the, we basically sum the degrees of the nodes that are inside the S. And so what we try to do here, we try to find a bipartition that is such that we'll have few connections between the groups, but at the same time, that we should be relatively balanced with each other. Yes? Well, what can be shown is the following. There is this Cheeger inequality that will show that actually there are some bounds that exist between, between, the, Cheeger, between the Cheeger constant, the, the, the conductance, and the spectral gap. And this, but the, these inequalities basically tell us the following. They tell us that if we have a graph that has a very small value of the conductance, in the sense that it can be partitioned into sets of two sets of nodes with just a few connections with each other, this will mean that the spectral gap is going to be very small. And if the spectral gap is very small, it basically means that the relaxation of the random walker towards stationarity is going to be extremely slow as well. And this is a very important concept because it relates a very graph theoretical object, the notion of conductance, with a spectral one associated to dynamics that would be this uh, spectral gap. And again, this is very intuitive. If we have two groups of nodes with few connections, that would basically mean that we have some sort of a bottleneck between them. But this bottleneck will basically lead to, uh, it's going to basically lead to, yeah, it's going to slow down the way by which diffusion can escape one group, reach the other group in order to reach the global stationarity. Okay, so so thank you, th thank you very much for your attention. So so we've been covering now discrete time random walks. Now, in the next video, we'll be interested in a very important application of discrete time random walks on networks that, that can help us to quantify the notion of centrality for directed networks, something that is called page rank. But that's going to be for, for the next video. So, hello everyone, and welcome for this second video of the week uh, six for the course of networks. And today, what we're going to be doing is to talk about page rank. So, so if you remember in the first video of the week, we've been considering in detail uh, well, the properties of a discrete time random walk process on graphs. And we've been characterizing the way probability is going to be flowing and reaching asymptotically a certain equilibrium distribution, at least under the conditions that the dynamics is ergodic and that's the underlying graph is connected mostly. Now, now, the thing is that this equilibrium distribution that we noted P star last time can actually be used for certain purposes. And one such purpose is in order to, yeah, to, to characterize the centrality of nodes in a graph. And if you remember, we've already seen yeah, several measures for centrality. We've seen the degree centrality, the betweenness centri centrality, the closeness centrality, the Katsk centrality, and those were all centrality measures based purely on the underlying graph. Now here with page rank, we'll be, yeah, we'll be proposing a centrality measure that is based on using how a certain dynamical process assigns a certain importance to the nodes of a graph. Now, page rank is really meaningful when you focus on directed networks. And I'll explain this to you later. Well, in, in just a few moments. So here we'll be looking at di directed networks that we didn't consider in the first video. And so for directed networks, so it means that we have a network like, th like this one, for instance. 
Well, for directed networks, part of the properties of the, of the random walk process will actually be quite different. Now, first of all, how is the, the process characterized? Well, at each step, we'll basically uh, design the model such that the walker Uh, located a certain, at a certain node, located at a certain node i, will jump, jumps to one of its out neighbors. Because indeed, when you have directed networks, you need to differentiate between in neighbors, those from the incoming links, from the out neighbors, those that are associated to the outgoing links. And so here in the example here, for instance, you would have that if you have a worker that is located here at a certain step, with the property one half, it will go in this direction and one half in that direction, but it will not have the possibility to take this edge that goes in the wrong direction. Now, in well, you know that if you want to characterize a random walk process because of its equivalence with the Markov chain, you need well, to write on or to be the transition matrix of your process. And here, this is going to be a yeah, small generalization on what we did before. The transition matrix of going from node i to node j is going to be equal to the adjacency matrix aij, where aij is different of zero if you have a link from i to j, and it needs not be a symmetric matrix anymore divided by k i out by the out degree of node i and indeed here node i at two out neighbors so with probably one half i'll take one neighbor with probably one half i will take the other now how do you define uh, this uh, page rank so page rank is going to be defined as the stationary Uh, density of the of the random walk and actually by definition it means that it's going to be a certain it's going to be a certain p vector p star well a certain p i star such that we'll have that this will here be well of p j it's going to be equal to uh, a sum over the j's, uh, sorry, a sum over the i's, excuse me, of p i star, and then we'll have a i j divided by k i out. Yeah. Or in vector notations, we have that this vector p star is simply given by this. Yeah. Now, what it means here is that this vector that defines the stationary density of the random walkers, and so all of its entries is going to be, by definition, the page rank of that corresponding node. Well, this vector is the eigenvector of eigenvalue one of the transition matrix that comes here from the directed graph. Now, how can we interpret this? Well, clearly we'll have that a node will be important. The importance of a node is going to depend on the importance of its in neighbors of all of the, all of the links that point to him. So, and the more of those nodes I have, the better. But I just need to be careful that here I am dividing by the out degree of node i. So it means that a node will be important if so a certain node j is important if it receives typically many connections, but actually these connections are going to be weighted by, is this node here important or not? So if you have many links coming from many important links, this is going to be good. But you just need to be careful that if those uh, neighbors have a degree, a node degree that is too large, they will not contribute much. Because basically each of them has a certain, yeah, a certain total importance that they can share to their out neighbors. So it means that 
Typically, if you want to have a high page rank, you need to have many, many connections coming from high, high well, from important nodes that are such that they do not have many out connections. So ideally, for instance, if I was to be uh, on Twitter, well, if I was to be followed by someone like uh, Barack Obama, and Barack Obama only follows me, well, that would be much, much more meaningful and give me much more importance than if I was followed by Barack Obama, but Barack Obama is following one million people. Because otherwise, it's important to be diluted and basically distributed among these uh, million people. Okay. Now, actually, there is just a problem here. And the problem is that well, we've been talking about the stationary density of the random walk process. But the problem is that this P star is uh, is is not going to be unique. Is not unique, except if the underlying graph is strongly connected, and. And the thing is that there's no uh, imposing that the graph is strongly connected. Well, it might be, yeah, nice mathematically, but in practice, it never happens. And most of the graphs to, to which you, you will be confronted with, if you analyze directed networks, will have, might have a core that is strongly connected, but except for that, we have many components that will not be belong to it. And even worse, in many graphs, you will have situations where you would have, I don't know, like this would be here, a strongly connected component. But what will happen, and so let's do it like this, but the problem is that you, you will have the presence of one absorbing state here, and the presence of certain transient states as well. And actually all of those will be transient. Which basically means that if you look at the asymptotic density of walkers, well, depending on your initial conditions, you will be absorbed in certain absorbing states, and you will have like some trivial uh, centrality measure that will put all of the importance in the absorbing states, it will be ill-defined because it's going to be de depending on your initial condition, and even worse, most of the nodes that would be transient would simply have a page rank of zero. Now, this is something that has been recognized for some time, and in order to circumvent these, these problems in practice, well, different mathematical tricks have been proposed in order to make the dynamics ergodic, even if it was not on the original graph. The most standard way to do so is to allow the worker to uh, do some random teleportations. So we'll be considering the possibility to, to have some teleportation. What, so what would be the process? So I will first write it down, and then I will explain how it works. So now, the equation that we'll be looking at now would be this one here. It's gonna be equal to a alpha, and then we have a sum over the j's of p, j of t. We'll have this t, j, i, plus one minus alpha, u, i. And what is this ui, the vector ui, this vector u1 until un, is usually called the uh, preference vector. And, it's, and it satisfies, it satisfies the fact that the sum over the i's of the ui is equal to one. And, and the UIs are also positive numbers. Now, well, so, so it means here that the UIs can be interpreted as some probabilities. And if you think about it in, in those ways, it basically means that when you do teleportation, what's happening? With the priority alpha, you will have that the worker is going to be following edges, as in the original, uh, uh, as in the, in the original random walk on the original graph. While with the priority one minus alpha, the worker will not follow a link, it's going to teleport independently of the underlying structure and is going to be arriving on nodes randomly 
with a priority that is going to be given by this preference vector. Okay. Now, the thing is that uh, in general, if we have if we have that the UIs are all different of zero, if they are all positive, strictly positive, and we have that zero is smaller or equal to alpha, strictly smaller than one. So we, if you do at least just a bit of teleportation, then whatever the underlying graph, you will have that the random work process is going to be, uh, you know, what did I mean to say? It's going to be ergodic. And we have a unique P star. So it means that as soon as you have just a bit of teleportation, you can be sure that the process is going to be converged to one unique uh, to one unique uh, solution. Now, of course, you have a parameter here, and the problem is how do you choose it? And so typically, very intuitively, well, you wouldn't like to choose the alpha too small, because if the alpha is too small, well, it will basically mean that you're going to be teleporting a lot, and so you, you're going to be losing yeah, all of the signal that comes from the topology that you're interested in. But you don't want to have alpha that is too close, too close to one, because if you're too close to one, actually calculating page rank is going to be converging very slowly, and you're going to be confronted to possible numerical instabilities. And so typically, people tend to choose the value of alpha that is neither too small, neither too large. And historically, the value of alpha that the people take is of an alpha of 0 0.85. And actually, the, the, this value of alpha of 0 0.85 comes from well, the, the original interpretation of the process. So here, this teleportation was initially thought of as a way to model the way uh, people would be browsing the web. And, and clearly, when you browse the web, you start from a page, you may follow a certain number of links, and then you stop and you start from a new node. Yes, you start from a new page. And you could arrive from the new page from any from any way, but you start from a page that is unrelated to where you were at the end. And at the time, it was observed that actually, if you looked at the chain of of, of clicks that the people do, well, this chain of clicks, the length of them would be compatible with a value of alpha that would be of the order of somewhere between zero point eight and zero point nine. And that was one of the historical reasons why people picked this value of 0 0.85. Now, there have been many, many works trying to understand the impact of alpha on the, on the page rank, trying to, to find out what would be, yeah, so maybe sensible ways, like computational ways to decide what would be the right value of alpha when you're confronted to, to a system. But that's, that's something that goes beyond the scope of this course. Now, now, very often, so as I said, the value of alpha is turned to be 0 0.85, and the most popular and standard choice of UI would be to take one of n. So it means that when you teleport, you give the same importance to all of the nodes. Now, this is what we are going to do mathematically just after, but in practice, when, for instance, search engines are using PageRank, because they've been at the origin of uh, search engine. So people, uh, been, this page rank has been proposed as a way to rank the importance of web pages on, on the web. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, when I do a search or any of you does a search, it will, he, will not, he or she will not receive the same answer. And, and the reason for that is that the page rank tends to be personalized. And so for instance, in my case, that might be a preference vector that is more aligned to my own interest. So that's the system will basically know from my past research what I'm interested in and somehow bias where, where the search is done in order to assign importance to nodes to the, the topics that I would personally find interesting. Okay, so very good. So we have this page rank. So actually, it's interesting. It's in, in, instructive to write down the solution a bit formally. And here I show explicitly the dependence on alpha. And so you would have that the page rank can be rewritten as this, some of the j's of u j, and then we'll have here this identity minus alpha t minus one, and then we'll have j i. 
Now, when you look at it that way, it looks a bit, it feels a bit like the cat centrality. But, but for the cat centrality, if you remember, we had something like one minus alpha a minus one. And we needed to be careful because the, depending on the larger second value of a, we could not choose any, of any value of alpha. Here, because the larger second value of t is one, actually, we will not have any kind of constraint on this value of alpha. And that comes from the fact that for page rank, you looked at all of the, well, you, you did not have any kind of conservation of random walk taking place. You were counting all of the, you know, all of the walks that would go from one node to another one, while here, because we have this transition matrix, we weight those walks, and that leads to some conservation rules. Now, this solution can again be rewritten as p i star i alpha, so p i star alpha is equal to u i plus a sum for uh, l going from one to infinity of alpha to the power l. And then we'd have a sum over the i, uh, sorry, sorry, sum going from the j, sorry, going from one to n of uj times tjl, uh, tji, excuse me, to the power l minus tji to the l minus one. And when you look at that, well, it clearly shows as well here. So there is this explicit dependence on alpha. And when the alpha is larger, it's going to be giving more and more importance to the longer walks. And each of these long walks is going to be contributing according to these, uh, these terms. Now, here things are still a bit vague. And, but the thing is that when you choose explicitly the UI, to be equal to one over n, you arrive at an expression that is a bit easier to interpret. So you would have now this solution, one over n plus a sum for l going from one to infinity of alpha to the power l of n. And then we'd have a sum of all of the j, j prime going from one to n of k j prime in minus k j out divided by k j prime in times t j j prime t j prime i uh, to the l minus one. So how can we interpret this here? That would be the, the, the contribution of a walk of length l on the centrality of node i. It basically, it means that we have node i, and what we have here from that, we have a certain walk that starts at a certain j prime, and this one has a length l minus one. And for that one, we're going to be looking at a certain i, yes? No, oh, sorry, we're going to be looking, so here I think that I made a mistake, at j. We're going to be looking at, at a certain j. And so we look now at what's happening for the, this last edge. Yeah? And given this walk that started at i and arrived, and, uh, well, started at j and arrives on the node i that you're interested in, we have a contribution that can either be positive or, or negative depending on the sign of this term here. And we'll have that we're going to be having a positive contribution giving more importance to node i. If we have that it's at that length l, we basically have that this node here has many more incoming links than that node there has of outgoing edges. Which again, if you think about it, it's really about this, this work of length uh, L. But the, the, at the end, does it tend to concentrate the flow of priority and then to, 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 to make this flow arrive on node L? Or initially, does the flow of priority go out and hence decrease the value uh, that we have. And here, what, what, what we directly see is that we're going to be having a contribution of all of these works of different length, always comparing the in and out degrees of the extremities of an edge. Now, this, uh, this observation well, leads to a certain number of interesting properties. The first one is, would be the fact that if you have a regular graph, 
meaning that all of, for all of the nodes, we have that the in degree and out degree of each node is a certain k. So we have that for all of the nodes, they have the same out and in degree. Well, if that was to be the case, you see obviously that all of these contributions are equal to zero. And you see that whatever the value of alpha, you would have that this pi alpha star is going to seem to be equal to one over n. Yeah? So it means that if you have a graph where all of the nodes have the same degree, well, all of the nodes are equivalent somehow. There is no possibility to distinguish between them, and they will all have the same importance independently on the value of alpha that you are interest, interested in. That would be a first interesting observation. Now, a second observation that, that actually we could have seen directly from here is, as we said, the page rank is given by this dominant eigenvector of the transition matrix. Now, for in the case of directed networks, that can be an object that depends, as, we, as we've seen, this is an object that depends on the whole structure of the graph. It depends on the path of any length and their contribution on each node. But on the other hand, we know that when we have an undirected network, and we'll basically have that the p star i is going to simply be equal to the degree divided by 2 so it means that if you have an undirected network and you try to make to measure the page rank for that graph, actually the page rank is nothing more than the degree. So that's the reason why page rank is not really recommended for undirected network because it provides you something that you knew already. And it's been a method that has been massively adopted instead for directed networks. Now, just one last thing that I would like to mention is the fact that here, I didn't say anything about the situation when I would I would have that. So what's happening when when in my work I arrive on a node that doesn't have any outgoing uh, outgoing link, and that would be something that is usually called uh, a dangling node. So this is a dangling node, a node that has incoming links but no outgoing ones. A uh, dangling node. Well, when you have dangling nodes, the the usual procedure is then to say that we force teleportation uh, when the worker is at the dangling node. So it means that if you are not on the dangling node, you have a certain probability to walk another one to teleport. If you if you are at a, at a dangling node, you always teleport, basically. It means that you will always be a teleportation in that case. Now, well, here, well, that was the first example where, if you remember last week, we've seen how the topology of a graph can affect dynamics. Well, here, through this concept of page rank, we are confronted to a first example where, in this case, a dynamics help us helps us to understand something about the topology of the underlying network. And here we've been using random works as a way to infer which nodes would be important and which nodes would be less important. Okay. Now, uh, as you see, this is something that we're, we're going to be continuing to explore, especially next week, where we'll be interested in community detection and trying to use random work processes to help find dense groups of nodes from a dynamical point of view. But before doing that, we'll have uh, one more video, or maybe two more videos, we'll see, on other applications of discrete time random walks on networks. So thank you very much. So hello, everyone, and welcome for this third week of uh, week six for the course of networks. And what, what we've been doing so far is to consider different theoretical uh, properties of random walks, discrete time random walks on graphs and networks. What we're going to be doing in this short video is to consider one possible application of the use of uh, random walks in order to uncover some unknown properties uh, in graphs. Now, there are many situations in statistics where you would have a population, yeah, population of individuals, that would be a certain population, yeah, and 
this we don't have knowledge of the whole population it's impossible to sample the whole population and this population is such that the nodes have certain attributes that we're going to be denoting by a certain y so we have this one has a value of y1 y2 y3 y4 y5 in this very small example yes and that would be our population and what we would like to do is to try to estimate certain statistical properties of this y inside the population. Now the thing is that uh, when you have a population, this population has typically some social relations existing between the individuals. And one way to do this sampling is to exploit these social uh, relations in order to try basically to explore the population and along the way to collect the values of, la of, of y that you've been observing in order to provide an estimate of the statistical properties of y inside the whole population. Now, very practical application would be, for instance, that the y might be the fraction, well, uh, uh, the fact that someone needs, so the y might be the state of someone, of individuals. For instance, infected or not, it could be binary for a certain disease, but it could also be some demographics. That could be, it could be some demographics, such that what would be the age. So that would be like a real value. So it can either be a continuous, uh, uh, a continuous value, or it could be a binary one, yes or no, infected or not. Now, one very popular way to solve this problem. And so as I said, now we know that inside this population, we do have a certain, yeah, we do, we do have some relations, some social relations existing between the individuals. Now one way to, to address this problem is by means of respondent driven sampling. We're gonna be sampling the population in a responsive way by using basically the individuals and it's usually denoted by rds so how does it work typically in, in rds we start from one individual and that would be the seed so this one would be the seed and this individual would have a certain number of coupons that he can share that he can give to his friends for instance, let's say that he has two of those, well, he would be contacting two of his friends. And these two friends would then be participating in the experiment, potentially giving us the value of their variable. And, and then also contacting two of their friends in order to, yeah, to basically to, to explore the graph in this kind of recursive fashion. Now, basically when you do so, you would have a sequence of values of y along assembly. Now, there is just one, and so let's assume that at a certain point we've been we've been collecting data from n s nodes. Well, a very naive way to estimate, for instance, what would be the average or the values of these yi's that have been observed during the during the sampling would be simply to do that uh, we would say that the average of y would be equal to one divided by ns times a sum for the node i's that would be in the set of nodes s that we've been observing and so here for instance those would, those would be the nodes that would be that we would have been observing times the yi. We'd simply do an average of all of the values that we've been observing. Now clearly, this doesn't seem to be a good idea if you think about what we know about random walks. One, and one, and one very important limitation is the fact that when we do sampling, well, well, well first of all, let's take a, a simple case, the, the most simple one. So let's assume that we, so each person only connects one friend. So it means that you have a seed, it's gonna be connecting one of his friends, and then once the friend continues, it's gonna be contacting another friend, and so on and so forth, right? So not two coupons like in the previous example, but just one. 
And let's assume further that the, the sampling can be done with replacement. Is with replacement. Which basically means that a, a person can be contacted more than once and participate more than, more than once to the experiment. Well, if you if we were to have something like this, that would basically mean the following. So we would be having, I don't know, like this is my graph. I would again be starting from this node. Maybe that I would then go to that node, right? And then maybe to this one, and then possibly back where I came from, and then maybe like this, and then like this, and so on and so forth. And it would be having that the sampling would be done by performing a discrete time random walk on the graph. So of course we've we've made some assumptions, one of which, well, first of all, we just have one print that is connected at each time. And also that the sampling is done re with replacement, which uh, which might be fair enough situations when the degrees are large, but when the degrees are small then it's likely that it's going to be something problematic. But these are the modeling assumptions. Well, if you do this in that way, what do we know? We know that at stationarity, we'll have that, assuming that the graph is, uh, is unweighted and it's going to be connected, we'll basically have that the stationary state is proportional to the degree Ki. Which basically means that when we do this kind of sampling, we would have that the high degree nodes would be sampled more often than the low degree nodes. Now this is clearly a biased sampling, right? We are, biased, we are sampling our population in a biased way because we are sampling the high degree nodes more often than the other ones. And this is something that we should somehow counterbalance if we want to provide a non-biased sampling of the population. Now, well, just before we continue, well, when people do this 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 kind of uh, of sampling, and 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 try basically to, to counterbalance the effect of the degree from this argument that is based on random walk, they have an estimator that is usually called in the literature RDS two estimator. And we're going to be providing it in just a, uh, a few moments. And actually, when the people do the experiment, they ask the people wh when they are connected, when they are contacted, to provide the value of their observable y yi, but also to provide an estimate to, of what would be their degree. And this is, well, if this is something where there might be some noise, but not so much, that would be here something where obviously there would be a lot of noise, because if I was to ask you, what is your degree in a social network? Well, I'm very sure that depending on the individuals, you would get very different answers, and it wouldn't be tr sure if these estimates would be, yeah, would they be unbiased, or, yeah, or and what would be the variance of those estimates based on the underlying, the underlying truth. And just when you think about it, what is your degree is a very, very uh, non-trivial question, it, and it very much depends on what is the degree corresponding to what process? And here what we're interested in would be the degree for a process like this one here, where people would be sending coupons to each other. Okay, so, so as we said, this estimation here is not good because it's going to be a very, uh, it's going to be a very biased one. And actually it's going to be causing trouble in situations when the Y's and the K's might be correlated. So in situations when the attributes might be correlated with the degree of the nodes. So for instance, it could happen that the, uh, the priority to be, to be uh, affected by a disease would be correlated with the degree. And so if we were to do the sampling in this way, you would basically overestimate the, uh, the prevalence of a disease inside the population. Now the way to address this is, as I said, to try to, to discount for this, uh, for, and to provide less importance to the high degree nodes. And the most simple way is simply to estimate the Y as follows. So we'd be doing a sum for all of the nodes that would be in, a, in the sets that have been explored so far, and we'd be doing YI 
divided by ki divided by a sum of all of those nodes are inside the set of one divided by ki. So what we do here is a weighted sum where we're going to begin with less importance to the high degree nodes in order to counterbalance the fact that they are visited more often. And that would be this RDS2 estimator. Now, this RDS2 estimator can be, yeah, can be used in the case of uh, like continuous variables or discrete variables. It can also be used when we basically have a certain number of discrete types. And so if, if we have a certain number of discrete states, that would be A, B, C, D, would have that we could estimate what is the probability that the state A is observed inside the population, and the state A might be the color of your hair, for instance, is it blonde, uh, white, gray, black, uh, brown, and so on. And so you would have that now, this estimate would be a sum of all of the i's that would be inside A intersection with S of one divided by ki, divided by a sum, all of the i's that would be in S of one divided by ki. And those two estimators are estimators that are used in demographics, for instance, but also in, in epidemics, uh, like in epidemiology, in order to estimate certain properties that would be in a population. And as I said, in a population where it's impossible to sample it, because sometimes you don't know what is the population of interest that you have, that, that you have to, to deal with. Or you just don't have like a, reg a registry of the whole population. Now the thing is that clearly, as we said, this here is just is based. Uh, this sampling is likely to be is going to be exact in situations when we're going to be doing very long samples, so that we can assume that we're going to be reaching stationarity, where uh, we can assume that the sampling is well modeled by this discrete time random walk. Now. Clearly, we already noticed that this year is something that is non-trivial because we cannot be sure that the people will be good at estimating what would be the KI. But there are also other properties, and those properties might be the fact that, well, first of all, in reality, we will not be sampling for very, very long times. So we cannot be sure that we're going to be reaching stationarity. So for instance, let's assume that we have a graph where we have a community here and then another community there. And we start our sampling here. Well, clearly in a finite time, it could happen that we would not have the time to escape this community and to reach the other one, right? Which would basically mean that the sampling that we would be doing and this sampling would be associated, well, the, the fact that we didn't have the time to escape here is related to the mixing time uh, and to this spectral gap that we've been discussing before. Well, that would basically mean that if we if if we have a time of observation that is smaller than this mixing time, well, what would happen is that the sampling that we would be doing would only be a sampling inside one of the clusters and not the whole population. And again, that would be something that would be problematic in situations when we might have some statistical relations between the observable and the uh, between the observable and the fact of being belonging to one cluster or the other one. And that's clearly something that needs to be dealt with. Another fairly important limitation is the fact that here we've been assuming that the yeah, the, the dynamics of the people who are contacted can be modeled by a random walk, but in principle that wouldn't be the case because we could not re-invite someone who invited us. Yes, it seems to be like a very basic, uh, uh, basic way to, to, to try to, to, to do the exploration. It's, we don't want to have this replacement, which basically means that in principle, it might be necessary to have more refined model for the dynamics. And one such model would be a non-backtracking random walk. It is a random, not backtracking random walk. That would be a random walk process. That would be such that let's assume that I'll start from this node. I go here. In a non backtracking random walk, I cannot go back where I came from. I can only take 
an edge that goes to a node that is different from where I came from. And so in this case, it would be that if I started from this and arrived here, and the next step, instead of having a priority one third on one third to select each of my neighbors, I would have a priority one half and one half to go to one of the others. And one possible refinement, indeed, of this uh, RDS type two uh, estimator is to, to try to, to, to model the dynamics of who, who's contacted by means of non-backtracking non random walks instead, instead of standard random walk. Yeah. So that was, I think, that fairly interesting uh, application of random walks to estimate the properties of uh, statistical properties inside hidden populations. And yeah, thank you very much for your attention. So hello everyone and welcome for this last video of week six, where we're going to be talking about continuous time random walks. So, so far we've been only interested in discrete time random walks. And in discrete time random walks, basically we, we, we basically had an ensemble of random walkers that were all making steps and exploring the graph simultaneously at discrete time. So all of the steps took place at the same time and these times were discrete. And so we basically had a certain time one, two, t, t plus one. Yeah. Now, when we, when we move to a continuous time framework, we're going to be stopping to have all of the workers to move together. All of them will move, but the times at which uh, the moves will take place will now be decided by a random process. And because of the outcome of the random process is different for each worker, we may have that the workers are not moving in a synchronized fashion anymore. Now, when, and so basically it would mean that you may have the first worker moving, making his first step there, then this one, this one, that, 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 and so on. And that would be for the first worker. And then if you have another worker, it would move like this, for instance. And of course, when you have this ensemble of workers, where you basically have that all of their motion are going to be not synchronized. Now, if you want to, 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 to define uh, a model for continuous time random walks, typically you need two ingredients. You first need a rule that tell you when a jump is done, what will be that jump. And for that, we'll use the same rule that you, that we've been using for discrete time random walks. So if I have a walker here, suddenly it wakes up and decides to move, well, it is going to be having a chance of one third to take either of those edges, right? But on top of this rule for the, uh, for, for, for the transitions, you also need some, some rules about when the motions will take place. So you need to characterize the statistic, statistics of the times at which events take place. Now the thing is that typically in the literature, you, you can distinguish between two big families of models where uh, for, for, co for continuous time run walks on networks. And these two families depend on the graph entity that is used in order to define where basically the timings at which events take place. So let's first focus on node-centric continuous time random walk. It would be this one here on the left. When in a continuous time, uh, in a node-centric continuous time random walk, basically what we have a walker, and a walker waits a certain time to, where to, so when you arrive on a node, you wait for a certain time to, where to is, a random variable and we'll be assuming that the times at which events take place will be driven by an independent Poisson process and that should remind you uh, of what we did during the first week of the course. Now, because we have an independent Poisson process, it means that the, the time interval, the inter-event times, the times that are basically separating successive events will be distributed like an exponential. So we're going to be having that the interval times will 
are exponentially distributed. Now, so here what we're going to be having is that, so we're going to be having a certain rate, lambda, at which events take place for such a Poisson process. And for the sake of simplicity, we set the rate lambda to be equal to one. Now, in a node-centric approach, when a worker decides to move, then with probably one third, it takes one direction, one third another one, one third another one. Yeah. And if we have, were to have four possible neighbors, we well, basically would have one fourth, one fourth, one fourth, one fourth. And so it basically means that if you think about the rate at which a worker starts from here and goes in that direction, well, that rate would basically be larger when we have less neighbors and smaller when you have more neighbors. Now, you can actually write down, so in the case of the node-centric continuous time random walk, you can write down what would be the master equation for the dynamics. And what you have is the d, d, d by dt of the vector p transpose of t. It's equal to the p transpose of t. And then we're going to be having minus identity plus the transition matrix. So the minus identity basically counts all of the workers that leave a node and go somewhere else, and that come, that happens with a rate of one. And this one basically says that with a rate of one, you decide to move, and then you follow the usual transition matrix in order to explore the graph. And this thing here can be rewritten as uh, P transpose of T, times, and I forgot what was my notations, but that would be here, the normalized, so it would be more the continuous time oh, sorry, not the continuous time, excuse me, so apologies. It would be, I'm um, mixing things, it would be the random mode, excuse me, la plage. Now this random mode la plage, so has so it's going to be having, and there's going to be a minus here. Yes, it's minus. So the, the continuous time of Laplace is the one on the diagonal, and it's going to be having minus the transition matrix for the rest. Now clearly, the transition matrix and the random mock Laplace have the same spectral properties, right? because the one is obtained from the other just by subtracting identity. Right? So basically it means that the eigenvectors will be the same. The only thing that's, that's going to be changing is that we're going to be shifting the eigenvalues. And for the transition matrix, we're between minus one and one. If you remember, well, for the, for the random walk Laplacian, we're going to be between zero and two. Zero is corresponding to what we had here. And that's for the stationary state. And the two is corresponding to this. And that would be what's happening when we have a bipartite graph, if you remember. Now, well, again, in the so for, for, for this process, well, because of this equivalence between the spectral properties of the transition matrix of the Markov chain and this random mock Laplacian, well, we can characterize many, many things about this process. And we know, for instance, that at stationarity, if the graph is undirected and connected, we're going to be having the, this piece uh, transpose star. So the stationary state is going to simply be equal to a vector. Well, we'll be having like this. We will have that P I star, which is the stationary state, is simply equal to well, the degree divided by twice the number of edges as before. So it means that for this continuous time random walk, we will be having that the, uh, the stationary density of workers is going to be proportional to the degree of the nodes. Now the thing is that there, are, there can be other ways to define a continuous time random walk on, uh, on networks, starting from the same transition matrix. And another one is in situation where instead of having that the times are associated to the nodes. Now we're going to be having that the times are associated to the edges. And in this case, what we do instead is that we're going to be assuming that now that will be the edges that will be associated to a Poisson process with a certain rate of one. 
Well, if you do so, it, clearly it means that if you have a worker that is on, 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 on a node with a small number of edges, it, it will move uh, f more slowly than if it was connected to a node with more edges. Because each of these edges is, a, is an independent process with the same rate. And so basically the rate of leaving this node is going to be proportional this time to the number of edges that, that are available for the motion. And indeed, if you write down now what would be the rate equation for this process, for the edge-centric pro uh, process, what you'd be having instead would be that so for the edge centric continuous time random walk, we would have d by dt of this p transpose t is equal to the p of t and then you will have minus d plus a where this d says before this diagonal matrix with the diagonal uh, with the degrees on the diagonal which is exactly minus p of t times the Laplacian, the combinatorial, the combinatorial, the combinatorial Laplacian that we've already been uh, considering for consensus dynamics. So it means that again we're going to be having something that is slightly different. Well, we have two different two processes that are equivalent in the situations where the graph is regular, when all of the degrees are the same. Basically, the two processes can be mapped onto uh, one onto the other. But in situations when the graph is not regular, we're going to be having two different random modes depending if we put the emphasis on the nodes or on the edges. Now, we already know, we've already solved for this, for, for the consensus dynamics. We know that this year, yeah, we've, so, we've solved the, the dual process. Yes. And for the dual process, we know that the stationary state would simply be a vector of ones. So that I can normalize here. So it means that at stationary we have that the, we, we reach consensus that all the nodes are basically uh, yeah, have, have the same value for the consensus variable. Now, because here we have that the Laplacian, this combina combinatorial Laplacian is is a symmetric matrix, which is not the case here. We know that its left and right eigenvectors are the same. So basically, this implies that if, if no, I'm interested in this p i star, what would be the eigenvector of eigenvalue zero for my uh, edge centric con con continuous time random walk? Well, this is going to be the same vector as this one, right? So it's going to be simply a vector of ones divided by n just for the normalization. So we see here that we have two different processes. And these two different processes have actually two different stationary distributions. In one, in one case, ki over 2m. In the other case, 1 over m. Now, just one last note before we finish. So, so here we see that, especially in this case, we can see that random work can be seen as a dual process to consensus dynamics. Yeah, that was the case here. In one case, that would be our consensus dynamics. Here we have the corresponding random walk process. Well, actually, this can be done for any random walk process. So, for instance, here I have this random walk process that is associated to my random walk Laplacian. Well, for that one, I can associate it uh, a dual consensus process that would be dt of x is equal to, uh, there should be a minus here, it, it, which is equal to minus L star times x. And again, it means that we can, for each of these Laplacians, and we here we just have two Laplacians, but actually it can be seen that you can have more of those. But for these two Laplacians, depending if you multiply to the left or to the right, we're going to be having either a random walk process or we're going to be having the associated uh, dual uh, consensus dynamics. So, so, so this concludes, this video concludes uh, this week about random walks, and we've been focusing mostly on discrete time random walks, but also extending uh, some of the results for continuous time random walks. We're starting next week, well, next week actually, we're going to be looking at the ways to use these random walks in order to look for communities 
and uh, in networks and to to see that, that there may be some some relations existing be between modularity that we've been introducing before and some measures that are based on random work processes thank you very much <laughs>